um, now 12 hours of recording, so you are pretty much up to date. Um, and um, today, our program is we will have two presentations. One presentation from Andrew Octopus, um, quadratic funding algorithms and mathematical formulations, I guess. And um, then Sean um, presenting, I think part of it is what you already have been doing in other projects with reinforcement learning applied to token engineering. And then on the other hand, perhaps some things you already tried out for Gitcoin grants funding. Not sure. Yep, that's right. Feel free to specify. Yep, that's right. Okay, that's right. Cool. Um, but I'd like to start with Andrew. So we have been discussing in the last academic session, uh, we have been discussing some performance issues with the quadratic funding um, algorithm. And there is, uh, there at least there was the idea to um, create a math focused working group, right? So I'm not sure, perhaps Andrew, can you maybe first share the state of this working group? Have you already had a session or, uh, just in case people would like to join um, what should be our channel or working mode or should we schedule them on Tuesdays or what's the plan? Uh, we don't, I don't have schedule. Uh, we don't, I don't have schedule. I hope we can. Uh, the sound is pretty bad. Um, maybe you might want to try with that video. With oh, okay. That's better. Still, That's better. yeah, a little bit. Let's try. I'm an echo. I'm an echo. Oh, and Sean, please. Uh, no, sorry. Boring. You are recording, right? Yep, I'm recording. Yep. Okay, I'm thanks. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, Good. Sorry, Andrew, for interrupting. Yeah, the working group. No, no problem. Um, mm. Can anybody hear Andrew? Is it just me? All right. So um, now, no. Okay. It's a bit quiet, but I can hear him. Maybe he can it's get better. close to the mic. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, well, there has been discussion. I, to be honest, I I'm a bit of a newcomer to this. I don't understand well enough what the vision of the other mathematicians who are involved is. There's a lot of talk of potentially switching matrix multiplication. Um, theoretically, that doesn't offer any speed up, but practically it might. I guess, if, I guess we should create a, a math working group. If you have any interest in that, maybe we can collect the people there seem to be four or five of us. Tuesdays would be a good meeting time. Those are my thoughts on that. Okay. Uh, maybe Danilo, um, maybe we can discuss this after this session briefly to set up a date and time for the math working group and make progress on that end. I just have to check um, what's the state on block sciences side. Okay. But now, um, yeah, um, keen to see your presentation, Andrew, on Gitcoin quadratic funding algorithms and quadratic funding beyond Gitcoin, I guess. Andrew, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Um, let me check. Should Not see. exactly size, right? Yes, we can see a screen, but it's somehow cut off. Oh, it <laughs> seems that um, the screen size. Yeah, this, this is better. Not sure if we can see the f entire screen, but mm, looks okay. Let's try. Yeah, this is better. Right. Okay. Okay, good. So um, good. My, my first objective was to understand the quadratic funding algorithm itself. So 
that's the primary result today. And I read the quadratic funding paper three times to, to break it down into components that I thought my students so this presentation may actually be a bit basic for some of you who are familiar with the algorithm. I'd be happy to do a more technical uh, at another time. Uh, my objectives were to talk in detail about the Gitcoin grant CR CLR algorithm, and we don't talk in detail about this. But to actually break down some LR formulas and give some LR intuition, and then to introduce some principles that I think are useful when we're talking about the So one principle that's really helpful, especially for commuting, uh, communicating mathematics, is the rule of four. And that says that anytime you have an idea, you'd be able to express it in four different ways. So if you're thinking about the radius of a circle, you can think of it as the formula, pi r squared, or as the numbers. You could express it in words, or you could look at the graph. The rule of four is an idea that's very, very basic in math. It starts at calculus one. Um, and you'll notice algorithms aren't here because they're not a calculus one topic. So you could even extend it past the rule of four to maybe a rule of five, six, seven, or eight. And a second principle that I'd like to utilize today is named after the mathematician George Polya, who said, if you can't solve a problem, then there is a simpler related problem that you can solve. Find that problem. So all of the examples today will be a bit simplistic, but they're intended to help gain. The problem that we're looking at is how to best allocate the resources of a computer. And we'll start with a specific framework that you're all familiar with. We have users who are contributing to grants, which are ideas for projects. So mathematically, you can represent this as a bipartite graph, where the users are in one part of the bipartite graph, and the grants are on the other. The arrows between the two different parts of the bipartite graph are called edges, in case they're directed. And they're labeled by contributions from a user to a grant. We're going to assume that there's an outside pool of matching funds that will support grants in response to contributions. And so the algorithm that we're discussing is called liberal radicalism, which is proposed by Buterin. I just realized that. Uh, while in a 2018 paper. And they emphasize that the term radical is related to roots is used in three different. The square root function makes a prominent appearance. It's returning to the roots of the philosophical ideas they're considering. And it's also radical in the sense that it would be very different from current funding. What they call, so the, the algorithm for matching that we may be familiar with is what's called capitalism, or what they call capitalism. And in that, the matching funds are simply equivalent to whatever the individual user's contribution. So if three users each give one dollar, the total matching funds would be three dollars and the total fund. So in this context, if we look at comparing three users who each gave one dollar to one dollar user who gave three dollars, each grant would receive the same. But in scenarios that are more based in the real world, like maybe matching funds for a political campaign, this will tend to distort, distort the allocation towards the users with the most resources. So if you have a thousand users who each give a dollar, they're inconsequential compared to one user who can give trillions of dollars. And somehow that doesn't accurately capture the voice of the community, which should be uh, more considerate of the difference between smaller users who can give less money and not let it be dominated by one user. So that's the basic framework we're looking at. I want to check here and make sure that my audio is still coming. Yeah, 
Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So quadratic funding uses a different idea. And this is where the square root comes into play. Instead of just matching each individual user contribution, instead you take the square root of each individual add them up, and then square the results of the total of adding up all of those square roots. So I represented it here in a more mathematical framework where you can actually use notation that's familiar from bipartite graphs, like the target of a directed edge or the weight. In this case, the target of the directed edge is the grant, and the weight of the edge is the contribution. So this framework will boost the impact of several smaller donations. In this case, the three users each giving $1 would get matching of $9. Where the one user who gives $3 just gets matching fund $3. In comparing the two scenarios, it's worth noting that if we don't assume any limits on the matching amounts, then the larger user isn't harmed. So B didn't do any worse under liberal radicalism, but the small group of small A's did much better. So unfortunately, in the real world, the matching pool will have limited resources. So instead of the matching funds being able to be whatever we want them to be, we could imagine that they're just a dollar. And so in this case, it makes sense to allocate resources proportion. So to do that, we look at the LR score of each of the grants. And then the denominator, we're looking at as the total pi. And the piece of the pi you get is proportional to what your LR score was compared to the sum all the LR scores. So under our initial scenario, if we just had $1, the group of three users would get $0.75. Cents. The one user who gave $3 would get $0.25. And we would like to take this and generalize it a bit, because obviously one simple example that we've worked through um, is not nearly complicated enough to carry all of the information we want. So let's, in, let's complexify it slightly. Instead of just thinking about three users versus one user, we can think about n users versus one. So we're still going to keep our matching pool at one dollar because it doesn't really matter what the constraint on the matching pool is. We're, we're just looking at the percentage that each group sees. But instead of three users, let's imagine n users. And instead of one user giving three dollars, let's imagine one user giving n dollars. And then let's look at the proportion that the smaller group will receive. So as the number of users giving one dollar grows, they quickly dominate the match. And in fact, it's not too hard to prove that in this small scenario, the exact proportion would be n over n. So this may incentivize B to form what's called a Sybil, where B will split the donation among fake users that pretend to be different people. So B makes three copies of themselves, and each copy gives a dollar. And now they have optimized the resource allocation under the naive LR algorithm. By pretending to be multiple people, B now gets the same proportion of the the authentic of A. And in fact, B could play this game and subdivide indefinitely to obtain larger and larger proportions of the total match. And obviously, this is not a desirable outcome. The goal would be that the authentic will of the community is reflected. So one approach for defeating this strategy would be to introduce what's called a trust you give users a score based on some credibility metrics such as time, previous grants successfully funded, etc. Use this calculation of the score so that more trusted users 
have a better representation in terms of the grants that they support being funded. So the Gitcoin grants algorithm does utilize a trust. I haven't delved into of it. The second scenario is a quid pro quo scenario, which is where two users who each support grants sort of in isolation might do better by splitting. So instead of B giving four dollars to grants two and C giving six dollars to grants three, they would do better if they worked together and reallocated their resources like this. So for other mathematicians, I would say that I think a good indicator of collusion should be that we're dealing with complete bipartite subgraphs subgra bi that have relatively uniform edge weights because that's sort of the, that's sort of the scenario you see here. And I think that the attack vectors that were injected in some of the recent hackathons have explored some of these patterns. The approach that you might invoke to defeat collusion would be to have some kind of pairwise pen. So you look for users who made all of their contributions in the same family of graphs, and then you penalize it so that people who tend to think exactly the same exactly the same about things have their influence lessened. I guess organically the probability that two people would have exactly the same opinion about a wide variety of issues is pretty small. Okay, so let me say what I did not do well as I hoped I end up to do this. Um, first of all, we only dealt with one case. We didn't address what happens when contributions don't exceed the match. That uses a different formula in my reading of the Gitcoin uh, Git GitHub. And we could dis discuss that as well. And then we've left the actual Gitcoin CL CLR algorithm, which is essentially the our algorithm that was presented but with trust and penalty function implemented as a little bit of a black box. It would be good to work through an example of this and then if our interest is in complexity, it would be good to illustrate why this takes so long current implementation. And finally, perhaps you're unhappy with small examples that might be accessible to sophomore math and CS students legitimately. I was trying to gain intuition by working through small things to illustrate the basic idea of what was happening. Of course, the real world would be much different. So criticisms one and two are completely legitimate, and I would be happy to do a more technical presentation later in greater depth. But I also say that there are some criticisms of the paper that I think are legitimate. Um, it relies heavily on something that's apparently well known in economics, but they could not find the paper they reference in any sort of open access way. The second thing is their notation really makes it more difficult to understand what's happening. Uh, even one diagram of a bipartite graph would probably double how easy it is to. The final thing is when they're doing their proofs about optimization, they use ordinary and partial different derivatives way and that really obscures what's happening with individual users and it, it makes it a lot harder to read I wish they would address it. but I enjoyed reading the paper and trying to come up with it um, I guess I did not realize that I was supposed to talk about the complexity of the algorithm so instead I tried to build intuition about what some of the more difficult math might mean I would be happy to come back and look at the algorithmic complexity of this in greater depth. If you're interested in that, um, as a newcomer, I'm open to whatever feedback you have. Thank you. No, I thought that was really, that was really good for me because I'm also just sort of getting up to speed. So I think that was like a really cool breakdown. Um, I had a question though, like, uh, on one of your last slides, uh, you talked about how I, we've been talking about this a lot, sort of like pairwise penalty functions. And I'm curious, like, you know, it seems easy to like 
sort of suss out like ideologues or people that vote for all the same stuff, like two, three, four or five people voted for all the exact contributed to all the exact same stuff. But like, it seems to me like if you go a layer deeper, like in terms of collusion, like it would be really easy to create a triangle where like, you know, there's three things and I'm going to contribute to these two. You contribute to those two and you contribute to those two. And we just go in a circle. So it seems like there's even, I, I, maybe that's like a more complex thing that like Sean's stuff is trying to address by finding out like, how these colluding agents right like it gets pretty complicated but i'm just wondering if anyone's yeah, like thought I, about that or so uh i mean i'm not really familiar with the thinking of the gitcoin developers i'm reading this as a mathematical person their individual choices i'm not i'm not saying they're not motivated i, I don't understand the i do think though that the paper that was posted about the arbitrage opportunities that's a pretty sophisticated optimization strategy to be addressed uh, so you're right that like looking for complete bipartite subgraphs would be sort of the most obvious thing you could do but there may be much more sophisticated collusion strategies You also mentioned you also mentioned that there's like a different uh, matching algorithm. Like this was news to me that there's a different. I obviously haven't read the paper as closely as I need to, but there's a different matching algorithm for when the funds, the contributions don't meet the matching pool. Do you, do you have any like insight on that, or you just um, so haven't gotten there what yet? What I do like when I see the when I read the Gitcoin grants GitHub code, and then when I look at the mathematical specification you know, being formulated, um, it, do, it it just says that there are two different, and I really don't have any about this where the, the matching don't try to do that in the, uh, so it, that it, case actually, I don't think it's addressed in the paper. It deals with, it's, a, so the actual, the proposal in the paper is that you do a weighted average, pure capitalism and liberal radicalism. And you have a parameter alpha that adjusts which side you're waiting toward. If that is equivalent to the representation being given currently on GitHub, I don't see the equivalent. That would be help me break it down yeah. further. My intuition would be that it would just be proportional, like the the all the matching would be proportional to like sort of the um, this like liberal radicalism output, like whatever the, the sum of square root squared is, you just, if the matching pool is more money than the original pool, you just divide everything up according to, you know, like you just scale everything proportionally, but like how they do when it's more money. So I, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's so that one I, doesn't really. So I will, so I have this much intuition that I don't think it's as straightforward as that because the formula involves a logarithm and some other people. And I also think that doing it in that way doesn't provide any further contribution. So you would actually want the, the individual map to feed the map. You want to build your function in such a way, I would think. Users are punished for not contributing, or at least users incentivized for contributing. Yeah, fair, that's a good point. You don't want to end up in the same place with like a couple grants dominating all the contributions because only three people voted or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, that was really cool for me and I'm interested in the math working group. Uh, I actually have to drop off because of my day job, but I thank you. That was like super informative for me um, and I'm gonna watch the rest later. Sorry, I'm missing yours, Sean. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment, something that clicked for me, and maybe this is super obvious and maybe it's uh, has been discussed, but Matt, you talked about this sort of circular case where three people are all um, contributing to each other's grants, and then uh, Octopus, you, you mentioned that that would be a complete bipartite subgraph. And I that just clicked for me that, oh yeah, that, so I, I think this idea of like a complete bipartite, bipartite subgraph would is the extreme 
optimal case, right? Like of of how much uh, I guess a, a party of people could collude if they all were just voting for e or um, contributing to each other's grants. Um, is that like the the sort of the edge case of maximum? I'd, it's not necessarily collusion because that could be an, an it could be innocent as well. But is that like the edge case of what could be collusion? So I'm in talking to people, I'm unclear about what the community consensus on this is. Um, mathematically, I feel that as an optimization problem, the constraints and the objective function are both symmetric in the sense that it does not matter how you move around the users or how you move around their grants if they're assuming that they have equal budget. And so whenever the, both the objective function and the constraints are symmetric in a sense, you do end up with the optimal solution being something that is split uniformly among the input variables. So I haven't written a proof, and whenever I haven't written a proof, I'm really <laughs> reluctant to say something. But I feel that that probably is the, the extreme case. Now, what will happen, obviously, as developers introduce penalties for this type of behavior is you'll have co-evolution. And so then the optimal strategy will and I mean, we're human beings. We're never going to solve this problem completely. It's a game that we're entering, which we'll play forever. So that's my thoughts. Like once you tell me what function I'm trying to optimize, I can optimize. So then when you penalize me for imposing one strategy, I'll just change my strategy. Mm. Yeah. Interesting, super interesting. Yeah, this idea of co-evolution is pretty cool. Um, Andrew, thanks a lot for this presentation. I have a little bit of troubles uh, with the sound, but perhaps this is on my end, but it was really a great presentation. I already want to vote for your, your the next step, the follow-up presentation. <laughs> on the more complex aspects. But I think what what you've mentioned just now, this thing, okay, there's there's a co-evolution, also touches on what Jaja was mentioning with the transparency. So what route should we take uh, for an ecosystem like Ecoing Grants? So um, one route is, okay, you are improving uh, the let's say collusion detection and penalties. And, but then of course, um, colluders will come up with new ideas and new optimization strategies. And the other, the other route is simplicity and transparency. Mm -hmm. So that the, the basic, the rules are transparent to everyone. And of course there, there might be collusion, but it's transparent. So it's on, under the, the eyes of everyone and easily detectable. Yeah, not sure if that resonates or if you have even be able to hear me. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. So I think there's this idea so one, one way to formulate this problem that hasn't been talked about would be strategy, which actually you know, has literature about what happens when strategies start evolving. Um, there's another big idea called the no free lunch theorem, which basically says anything you do will have trade-offs. So, you know, there's not going to be one answer about, I guess, this isn't a pure math problem because human feelings, desires are involved. So I think that the math is just one aspect. And a optimal solution would be a socially optimal. I guess that's the best I can do right now. Yeah, what, what, whatever that might be, and certainly a topic to discuss in over the next few weeks. Thank you. Any any other comments?
Yeah, uh, I would definitely add that, let's say, a natural application of the of the no free launch theory on that case is that because, for example, uh, the pairwise algorithm supposes that, let's say, users have a unique distribution on, on, on how they allocate the funds to the grants, in regard to the unique grants. Uh, but what happens, for example, is that, let's say, a lot of users on Gitcoin grants donate to collections. So you have, let's say, a high number of users that when you look at the distribution of the grants that they are giving funds, uh, they are all the same. And the curious thing is that, let's say, this is penalized by, the, by that. So let's say, you, in thesis, you are reducing the collusion effectiveness by, let's say, also uh, disincentivizing uh, donations to uh, to collect to grants collections. So I think this uh, this is uh, a thing to add. I agree. So at least we can say that our data is distorted by the um, fact that there are collections. Yeah, exactly, because uh, the pairwise supposes that, let's say, each user is unique on their distribution of grants that they are donating or their multivalidated distribution. But what the collections feature make do is, is to actually make the that distribution more similar across users, even though there are legitimate users. Yeah, that's important to keep in mind. Anything else? Okay, if there are no other questions, and again, feel free to drop your questions also in the in the Discord chat. Andrew, I would love to have your presentation uh, on in our Google Drive to get back to it. And yes, again, I would love to have this um, second step. Uh, if you're up to it, uh, let's have a, have another presentation on on the quadratic funding algorithms. And okay. Okay, sounds good. Maybe two weeks. Okay, great. All right. And then now, Sean. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks, Andrew, for that. That's great to see the simple breakdown of what's actually happening with the math there. It's, it's a great primer. And I would like to join if there's going to be a sort of math a working group as well. I think I'd enjoy popping into that. Um, on a, uh, just a tiny note, just stick around once we close the call. Uh, stick around in case you'd like to take part in the math working group and we will briefly sort out date and time. All right? Awesome. Okay, so I've made a Notion document here and I've punched it into just now. I saw the one-stop shop and I put it in my row here for my presentation and I realized someone had already populated this which looks super interesting it's um, clr.py <laughs> so I just opened this up and um... oh this is from their web so I don't really know what this is but looks interesting to explore so I, c I left it there and I added my uh, a link to my presentation okay so a little bit of background and context. Um, from last year, we had the Ocean Protocol Study Group. And I'll just check, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes, all fine. OK, great. So yeah, last year, we had the Ocean Protocol Study Group. And there was an awesome presentation from Trent McConaughey himself, the founder of Ocean Protocol. And he gave a presentation on token engineering for Ocean Protocol. And um, really great presentation. 
I recommend you check it out. And he showcased Token Spice 2, which is this simulator engine that uh, he's built from scratch to model the ocean ecosystem and all the agents and agent behaviors and the evolution of the sort of token economy, um, the tokens in circulation, the value of the tokens, the value of the ocean DAO. And it's a great presentation. And I posed to him a question um, because my background is in AI. I, I've spent quite a few years really mostly just doing work with, with AI in, re in, not research, but sort of academia in my undergrad and masters. And then uh, uh, in some employment as a data scientist. And so I find reinforcement learning to be the most interesting of these topics. So I, I kind of posed a question to Trent and I said, well, do you see these agents as could we could we actually implement AI into these agents? And he said, yep, he's been thinking about that. That's that's actually kind of a natural progression. So Angela invited me to put together a presentation on this concept. And so I've linked in the video of the presentation there and I'll just open up this it serves as a good reference document that I put together. So it's this idea of reinforcement learning and token engineering. Uh, oh yeah, this is awesome. This is um, Google DeepMind's Alpha Zero playing StarCraft. So this is like an economy, right? Uh, all the workers gathering resources and building structures. And um, we've seen in, in just recent years that AI algorithms, particularly deep reinforcement learning, has, is now able to outperform the top human players in these kind of macroeconomic simulators. <laughs> and a concept here of this talk is that gaming, video games, have been used as the simulation environment for AI research for a long time. Um, DeepMind had their first breakthrough with um, algorithms that would play the Atari games. And um, these algorithms would actually just have input of the screen, the frame of the screen as a series of images. And then they would have this action space that is just like a human playing the game, which is the controller. So they can move the, the D-pad and they can press A or B. And just by doing that, just by perceiving the image that's on the screen and inputting actions into the control space, then they would play enough iterations of this game that finally they'd learn how to, oh yeah, and they'd have this objective function to maximize their score. So just by random movements at first, and then eventually finding patterns in these movements and uh, exploring states of the game and then exploiting the opportunities to increase their reward, these algorithms can, can actually get really good at game playing. So now we're evolving from just using video games as simulators to um, token simulators, right? That's what we're, we're doing here. We're a token engineering and we do this modeling and simulation. Um, so now we have these economic environments that we can use for training AI agents and testing AI agents. So I think this is a really awesome intersection of fields between this sort of game playing research with AI and the uh, economic game playing um, research with AI. So some background on deep reinforcement learning. Um, it's sort of this, there's these three pillars of machine learning where supervised is we have labels. So we're essentially feeding examples to our algorithm and it'll take a guess at what the right answer is. So for example, we might describe a house, how, you know, the square footage and the location. And we want this algorithm to tell us back the price that this house is going to sell for. And it'll give us a price. And then we'll take what that house actually sold for. That's the label. And we'll have the distance between the guess and the true example is the error. And the machine will learn to minimize its error over time. In unsupervised learning, there's there's no labels. There's uh, just, just sort of context creation. So um, uh, AI system will embed. It's generally a spatial embedding. So you just take some large data set with no no structure, like no labels, and this AI system can learn to contextualize um, these things into a spatial embedding. So the example here is with language. So you can embed words into a say a 3D 3D vector space, and then you can do vector operations on these words. Like you take um, the example is you take uh, king minus man plus woman equals queen, 
right? And you actually get these vector operations in this space, so that's pretty cool. But reinforcement learning is completely different. It, it, it's very different. It's kind of the odd one out. Um, it, it's um, it's modeled as a Markov decision process where we have a series of states and we have this kind of time dimension. And we have our agent moving through states over time. And at each state, it observes the environment and takes an action in that environment. And the action that it takes has an effect, uh, which it has an effect on the environment, which grants it some reward and transitions the environment into the next state. So this you can imagine an agent just like in a video game, like a Super Mario game, uh, where Mario is sort of traversing through this world. And at each moment in time, Mario is in a certain state. And Mario can take a certain action, like jump or run. And the, the reward is, say, gaining coins, or the, re more, the reward might be just summed at the end of the game, at the end of the level, because in Mario you get extra points for finishing the level sooner. And then there's this credit attribution process that maps the reward back to the um, sort of state action pairs. So what state were you in and what action did you take? And then we can assign a, a value score to that state action pair. And through this process, an agent can learn a policy so that given whatever state it's in, it can learn this kind of optimal action to take. So I think that's enough background on reinforcement learning. Um, I don't want to go too deep on this. There's a lot to, I have some good stuff to show. So we have stable baselines is this very cutting edge uh, library for a collection of well-defined and well-researched reinforcement learning algorithms. And historically, the problem with reinforcement learning is like it's so sensitive to these hyperparameters and how you tune how you tune these algorithms for different problems. So what Stable Baselines does is it takes these well-researched algorithms and combines them with very stable hyperparameter tunings, so we can get reproducible results. And here's the sort of hello world example of cart pull. So this this little thing learns to balance this stick. <laughs> um, so its action space is it can move left or right, and its reward is how long it can keep the stick in the air. And the observation space is sort of the uh, angular momentum of the stick, and the position of the cart, and the position of the stick, or sort of the angle of the stick and the angular momentum of the stick, and the position of the cart. Um, so. Yeah, read through this. It's a good article, and I talk about how Token Spice has this um, EVM in the loop property where we can actually run our agents as a simulation. Uh, but in the simulation, they can actually interface with smart contracts, and so it makes the action space very well defined for our agents, and it in, and it's very inviting for this process of reinforcement learning. And um, yeah, so I think I'll jump and check this out. And I give kind of an example. This is basically pseudocode of how we can augment some of these. Um, these are all the agents in Token Spice. We have the base agent, uh, data consumer, grant giving agent, uh, publisher, so data publisher agent, and uh, uh, data consumer agent. This is kind of the Ocean Protocol, right? We have data publishing and data consumers. and we, I took one of those agents and I augmented it with some sort of pseudo code to allow it to have these reinforcement learning properties. And I think that'll lead me into what came next. So after giving this presentation, it inspired Mark, who I think is in this call. I, I'm pretty sure he's in this call. And um, Mark has got excited about this process of token spice and deep reinforcement learning. And he, and he took this and entered a... Um, hackathon put on by the Ocean Protocol and and also Energy Web. So he um, we have this ecosystem where we have energy producers and then we have uh, energy optimizers, which are these kind of, you can imagine them as like a data scientist who is tracking all the energy devices and then making some models, statistical models to predict the consistency of those en the energy output over time, and then publishing those those forecasts so that the data cons the energy consumers and the whole society that's using this energy or the sort of energy distributors or whoever they may be they can use those uh, forecasts from the optimizers 
to understand what energy devices are going to be on at what times, and then they can uh, selectively sort of optimize which devices they're plugging into, and it creates this overall optimization of energy consumption. And in this case, the optimizers are publishing data sets on the Ocean Protocol, and then stakers can stake on the optimizers based on their accuracy performance. And so we have all these agents in this ecosystem, and it's it's a cool experiment that's ongoing uh, with with me and Mark and various others have have helped in and uh, um, contributed to this. And we did two sessions in the TEC labs to open up and showcase this work. So if you want to get a really good handle on what's happening here, I definitely recommend checking out these this two part series lab and we got to have another lab as well for this that people have been asking for more because we're like uh, Mark did some really cool stuff here. He he initially made it this token spice simulation and then he took those token spice agents and he and he plugged them into a CAD CAD model. <laughs> so he kind of like shoehorned CAD CAD and token spice together and Meanwhile, ran stable baselines to have this reinforcement learning properties where the agents are learning over time. And of course, there's a lot of complexity there. So I would say this project is still in early stages to be, say, production ready. But I, it seems to be very promising. And it's awesome that it's like always continuously evolving. Um, so I think we got to have some more TEC lab sessions on that. And reach out to Mark if, if you want to check that out. Or, or check out these videos. They're, they're great. And so that's some background on where we've got to um, this sort of intersection of reinforcement learning and uh, token engineering. So that brings us to the Gitcoin ecosystem. So first of all, you know, we have these tools, but what do we want to do with them, right? So for me, I, I came back, this, I think this is an amazing map that we have here of all of our uh, research interests. And, um, I'm pretty sure the size here is sort of the centrality to the ecosystem or maybe the importance or the the relevance to our our research. So so for me I zoomed right in here and not only are these the biggest circles but they're also I think relevant to this idea of agent modeling and reinforcement learning. Um because what do we want to, what can we do, right? We we're going to give these agents some sort of reward function and then let them run and see what see what they can find. So one way to do this is with the collusion detection. So uh, actually, that's that's what we're going to get into. That's that's where I've started with this. But I think maybe a more complex, more challenging approach, but also more exciting would be not just modeling, you know, collusion behavior, but how can we actually just what would be the optimal behavior of agents in the Gitcoin ecosystem? Um, how could, um, and, and then so what then what is optimal behavior? So for me, I found this really interesting on the Gitcoin website. Th these are their um, optimization objectives of, of the whole ecosystem. So self-reliance, intellectual honesty, collaboration, empathy, stress reduction, inclusivity, and giving first. So if we could somehow have quantitative metrics for each of these factors, you know, this is really difficult. Like how do you quantify intellectual honesty? Well, maybe deduplication of different ideas and, and all this, but oh boy, it would be a giant, I think we would have to combine all of our research projects into one to be able to sort of quantify all these and then use like an agent-based approach to optimize these. But for me, that's like the long term, I think, what we should be striving for with these technologies. With reinforcement learning, we, we can, it's this ability to find, it's like a search algorithm for optimal behavior. And... Uh, it would be really cool to see this work long term to be able to use reinforcement learning to strive towards actually optimizing the ecosystem on these metrics. Um, but for now, we're going to start with something a little bit more simple. So I opened up the and I'm just going to ask Angela, is there are we all over at the hour or is do we keep going? Is this an hour and a half? No, no, we are. We can. Continue until eight. So this is still one hour left. Oh, great. Okay. So no, no pressure here. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Okay, so I found this uh, really interesting to get started with. This idea, this this to me is the clearest visualization of what we're doing here. We have this sort of organic distribution of um, of contributors, and uh, let's see, we need to change these axes because this this has been copy and pasted. Okay, so. Uh, the, we hypothesize that this optimality has a bimodal distribution. Cluster of communities with a large optimality gap, so that's what we see here, representing low optimization of funding on behalf of organic grants. So there's this organic distribution of grants. Some are going to get a lot of funding, some are going to get a little, but there will be sort of this it might not be a normal distribution, but we can probably model it as a normal distribution and we'll see there's some average amount of funding that a grant will get and there's some standard deviation. And then there's going to be this other cluster of communities with a small optimal gap, which could indicate grants which are adopting colluding strategies. So if there's this, so maybe by colluding we can actually move and have this, this, this sort of distance between these two modes is the amount of optimalness that we can achieve on average through collusion and so we're going to see that colluding grants are going to have this other distribution here with a, a higher optimality and so what we're trying to find is if we can simply I mean if e even just applying this to real data of all the grants if um wait no yeah we couldn't apply it to the grants directly so we have to do this network modeling um but yeah we could take the network of real data and um do so so we would have to do this like subgraph danilo you might want to help me out here so how could we take the real world um grant data and compute this kind of chart would we have to check every like subgraph or um would the axes here be yeah can you help me out a little bit with what these axes should be so this is a distribution so if you are interested in communities uh, then you are calculating open gap per community so the vertical axis would be the optimality gap. The horizontal axis would be the, let me see. Oh no, actually I, I diverted. So the horizontal axis is the optimality gap. And the vertical axis is the number of communities. Mm -hmm. And then a com what's a community? Is it, is it a sub, it's a subgraph? Ah, yeah, the, you are sharing the research plan, right? So it's the number of grants in your in, in your case, because uh, we are, let's say, using overlapping communities. But if you use, for example, a community clustering algorithm, it would be it could be number of communities. Okay, awesome. So we have uh, communities, number of communities, and optimality. And in in this case, the communities are the the grants. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we have this collusion detection here. So I wanted to see if we can use reinforcement learning to uh, generate this distribution, like based on the actions that the agents can take in the simulation, uh, can we get this result as like a beginning heuristic um, to, to test out this hypothesis? And so, um, this is, I, I sort of whipped up a small simulation, I'll, I'll jump to that in a bit, but this is the idea of what we're looking for, where we have this colluder distribution and the organic distribution. And my idea was we could use reinforcement learning and have a number of simulations where on each simulation the colluders are learning to increase their um, optimality. Now, it might make more sense to just have the colluders try to learn to maximize amount of funding received. That, m that might actually be a simpler approach to this. But, but I, I got inspired by this distribution idea and thought, okay, can we train our agents 
to increase the optimality of, of their grants. And I think that make, that does make sense, yeah. So in the stable baselines documentation, we have this and this, uh, it's not so easy to find if, if you don't know what you're looking for, but basically what you want to do to uh, leverage this reinforcement learning library is you want to find this using custom environments page. And this shows you how to build a standard environment. And what is an environment? It has an action space. These are the actions that your agents can take. It has an observation space. And this is what your agents observe on every time step. Um, it has uh, one step defined. And you're going to notice so many similarities between this field of reinforcement learning and the field of like um, dynamic systems modeling that we see in CAD-CAD. So we have the step, uh, in which case we're returning an, an observation from the environment, a reward. Oh yeah, we're going to, oh yeah, this is based on an action that we're going to take. And uh, based on that action, we're going to get some reward. The observation is going to, uh, the environment is going to move into a new state, which is going to give us a new observation. And we're just going to check whether or not we're finished and any metadata that we want to return as well. So that's a good resource um, for anyone looking to apply reinforcement learning to any problem. So now let's get started. So what I've done is I started with our home repository here and forked it over so we can see everyone who's forked it so far. Um, Octopus Research. And so I'm going to jump over to this long tail financial fork and um, let's get started. So the first, so I want to touch a little bit on the process that I took here. So I am going to jump so into my workspace and then I have this TEC and I'm going to clone in here. Okay, so it already exists. So I'm just going to make a temporary directory and get clone. OK, so the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go in there and I want to activate a virtual environment. So I use this little utility tool. It's called Virtual Fish. And uh, it makes it really easy to manage Python virtual environments. So I'm going to make a new one called Gitcoin CAD, CAD uh, model. And then we usually have these uh, requirements. So I'm going to install those. pip install dash r. And this is, should all be in the readme. So to, to run this code, just simply follow um, create a virtual environment. Uh, install all the requirements and then we can change the simulation parameters with env config and we can run a simulation. So I've made a, some updates to this uh, readme. Um, Danilo's made something really cool here. He's actually added in help functionality um, to the main interface here, the run simulation.py. So all of our requirements have been installed. So let's try that help function. So we can go python run simulation.py dash dash help. And it wants us to pass a number of time steps and whether or not to compute the uh, quadratic funding, um, which says can be computationally expensive. And it wants us to pass yes or no. So I'm going to go. Python run simulation dash dash n a hundred and dash dash compute uh, qf um, yes. Okay, cool. So it works and this produces data. So that's great. Um, and just to make sure everything is working as it should, we should have some tests here in this uh, code. So, so this is what I came to. And as cool as reinforcement learning is, I want to make a point here that since we have so many people collaborating on this research, 
if we're going to be adding in um, really cool new modules that can, you know, test out the quadratic funding or different agent strategies, then the ultimate goal is to be able to pull that code into well-maintained modules so that we can access it. And we can see that Danilo has done a really good job of that. Um, and I, I just find after sort of years of practice, the development cycle with this kind of stuff, data science and token engineering, tends to be, for me at least, sort of living in the Jupyter Notebook environment and doing all sorts of all sorts of exploration and experimentation. And then finally getting something that really makes sense, a model that accurately represents what I'm trying to model. And then I pull that code out and lock, put it into Python modules. Um, and what do I mean by that? So we can explore everything here. So the functionality of the optimality, optimality gap, and we've seen this through the live coding examples. Um, and then the actual modeling here, where we have our sort of CAD CAD definitions. Uh, we have our partial state update blocks and uh, different parts of the model. Um, we have the system here. So these are our state update functions and our policy functions. So often when you're building this stuff out at first, you might just be using the Jupyter Notebook. But once you get these really nice, good functionality, you want to pull this out into modules so that it can be version controlled and we can run tests. So I'm going to um, install PyTest. And I'm going to run uh, PyTest here. And so we get something. Now, what's happening? We don't have um, subgraph optimizer. Let's see. No module named subgraph optimizer in test optimizer. So we have our, where are our tests? Um, test. Test optimizer in our optimi optimality gap sub package. And we're trying to, uh, it says no module named subgraph optimizer. Um, yeah, so I guess I did more work last night than I remember. I don't really remember. <laughs> I, I remember there was one issue that I fixed and I kind of wanted to showcase it, but um, I think I actually did a lot more yesterday. So I think I won't do go too deep into this. I'm going to jump to the, you know, in those cooking shows <laughs> when they, uh, they mix everything together and then they put it into the oven and then they just have one that's already cooked and they, they take it out. <laughs> so I'm just going to jump to the one that's already cooked. And so what I was doing here, I was working in a temp directory uh, and I had just cloned. Um, and I'm going to jump back to my actual workspace uh, because I rearranged the test structure in here and it should all work now. Um, let's see. Um, PyTest. Oh, what's happening? Um, let's see. Um, Conf test network X. Oh yeah, I have to do this. PyTest dash dash ignore. Um, so usually in my workspace, I make a scratch directory where I can just do any, I can run random experiments and make random code files. And I add that to the git ignore so that it's not tracked by git. Um, but also what I've done here is I've cloned Danilo's specific version of network X that has the, um, mm, is this right? No, this isn't the right version. Uh, it should be uh, Danlessa Network X. Um, so I've cloned this specific version that has uh, the rewiring. Um, let's see. So this, oh, it's a certain pull request. Okay, so I went to Network X and I went pull requests, and then I searched for Denlessa. Oops, has it been merged? No. Um, rewiring. 
Here we go. Oh, it's a cert I was on the wrong branch before. So we go to Denlessa. Um, so it's uh, github.com slash denlessa slash networkx. And then you have to search for the specific branch, uh, which is called rewiring um, optimization optimizers. And in here, we get this networkx uh, rewiring, let's see, algorithms and rewiring. Yes. And we can find our metaheuristics.py. So here we get our simulated annealing optimizer that we had fun implementing in the Gitcoin hack session. And we're just waiting on this uh, branch to be merged into the network X. But for now, we can clone this specifically. So what I've done is I just go to Denlessa network X and go to the rewiring optimizers branch. Now let me, I thought I had a link to this in my documentation, but uh, so. There we go. Let me see if this fixes my... Okay, so here I am again in my temp directory. So this is like the fresh instance that we're, that we're baking. So what I did before is I... Um, okay, so I made a directory scratch that I like to throw random things in to reference. And then I can git clone um, Dan Less's uh, fork here of network X. And then I can go in there and I can go git uh, branch. Okay, I can go git checkout rewiring optimizers. So now I'm on the rewiring optimizers branch. And so if I go back up to the Gitcoin modeling here, what I did is I just copied um, the, the, so we have the network X repository and then we have the network X um, package and I moved it here. So now I have access to it directly. So I have network X here and we have our special functionality. Now I know this seems like really crazy and complex. Um, <laughs> Danilo, is this, am, am, is there a way easier way to get access to this or does this actually make sense? Maybe I've lost some people. Uh, there is a easy way, but, um, uh, I mean, I was running into a certain bug because, uh, Long story, but I think that, let's say, the way we ought to build bugs right now is to clone the, uh, the branch and go with it. And actually, I'm working on fixing that bug right now. Awesome. Uh, yeah, but in order to shell, uh, it's a bug that you need to change a setup that by file. If not, uh, there is some tricks of how you can modify the network, networks, network X code. Okay, um, so yeah, so yeah. This, this is fun stuff. So as a community, we have to make sure that uh, we always we can always test each other's code and find out those different edge cases of where it's um, breaking. And I, this is really the fun, you know. It it took me I was I'm, it, I was quite a few years into my career of doing software engineering before I started to really appreciate the value of tests uh, and the peace of mind that they bring when collaborating on code. It's just awesome to run all the tests and see that everything passes. Um, so this is, this is the way that we can sort of all collaborate on these code bases and uh, build off of each other's work. Um, so I'm surprised though in my clean version that I have here from last night, I'm not sure why, oh yes, it's passing, okay. <laughs> so this always feels really good when you get this green. Um, mm -hmm. Any questions at this point? 
Maybe, Sean, I'd like to take a step back and let's just check um, what happened so far or, or rather what's your objective here. So as far as I've seen your presentation now, it feels like, okay, we are still um, on, on the route for exploring or defining the optimal result. And instead of using edge rewiring, as yeah. Danilo did, yeah. In his hacking sessions, you are applying reinforcement learning to find the optimal, right? Yeah. Well, I'm creating a, a skeleton framework to 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 mm -hmm. do that and then flesh that out. And I think it will use actually. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. It's kind. Of, I haven't completed this project by any means, but I just that this everything you just saw was a bit of an aside on some of the structure of the code base and how to sort of fork and. Um, maintain different branches and and be mindful of using this uh, PyTest functionality to check that when you're building on the repository, everything's running. So now we're going to get out of this craziness and uh, back back to the land of data science. <laughs> um, so I have uh, that was all all an aside that I wanted to go through. Now I'm going to open up this um, back to the presentation. So we have this idea of reinforcement learning, and uh, I have a fork that has this. Uh, I added this notebook called Toy RL, and it's just a little idea to get people thinking about how we can combine these ideas of simulating the Gitcoin ecosystem and then applying reinforcement learning in there. Uh, because, and the reason I just went through all of what I was just showing you is because. Um, I was initially trying to augment the simulations themselves that uh, Danilo has built, but uh, there was a lot of, it, it's a learning curve, you know, to understand how all the different pieces of the simulation are working. And so I ended up spending most of my night just sort of cleaning up things and making sure the tests work. And for me, that's a really good exercise to start to understand the functionality of all the components of the simulator. Um, and so I just want to inspire people that as if you're, if you're trying to get a grasp on the actual simulator and what's happening, a really great way to do it is to write tests for the functions because it serves two purposes. You're going to learn how those functions work and you're going to be contributing tests to the repository, which is super useful. Um, so. Agree. That's mm -hmm. right. So in, so instead of augmenting the simulator, I just I whipped up a complete fresh example of this little toy um, simulator, and so we bring CadCAD in here, and I just make some system parameters. I called it the number of honest, hardworking folk. <laughs> so these are like the organic uh, non-colluders, and then we have some population of colluders. So we say 500 organic and uh, 10 colluders. And then I have this initial state is the mean optimality of the organic communities and the mean optimality of the colluders. So I set this to uh, 0.5 for the organic and 0.3 to the colluders. And this I'm sort of abstracting away the actual strategies. So. Um, we're going to have an action. What we need to do is define the action space of the agents, essentially. So, and it's not hard. It's like, uh, which grants are you going to fund? Really, that's that's the action space. It's like, of all the grants, which ones do you choose to fund, and and how much for each one? So the action space is not so hard. But for now, I've completely like abstracted that away and just say, imagine the ac the action space is like a black box, and the agent is going to get to interact with it, um, but but all they're going to want to do is decrease this optimality gap. Um, so right now I'm using like a proxy. I'm not even dealing with the, sort of the grants and the network uh, topology of of the Gitcoin ecosystem. I'm just saying there's um, action space that allows you to change the level of optimality that you can achieve. And then we're going to have these agents try to, um, the colluders are going to try to decrease this gap. So I don't know if that made sense, but what I'm saying is I'm 
setting up the framework here where right now this is basically um, the agents are just trying to tune a random distribution to be more optimal and then later we can open up that tuning to actually be the action space in the Gitcoin ecosystem. So we just have two functions. One is to collude and one is to not collude. And we're going to take our the state of our simulator and we're going to sample a normal distribution based on the colluder. Uh, so we're going to have one distribution that is of the uh, colluder optimality and one distribution that is of the organic optimality. And our policies are is our organic um, policy is to not collude, and our colluder policy is to collude. And then we just update our collusion distributions based on the policies, and we wire that in, and we set up CAD CAD to run the simulation. And then we have our output. And um, then we get this cool kind of visualization where we're running 10 simulations. And my idea is to have these agents learn over every simulation uh, so that the idea here when this is all connected is that we should see the agents learning how to drift this their distribution towards the left. Because on the left, we have an optimality gap of 0. And on the right, we have an optimality gap of 1. And we have this organic distribution, which shouldn't really uh, drift over time. But as the colluders learn the collusion policy, we should see their mean optimality gap decrease. So the idea, and it's that's not quite wired up. I have the reinforcement learning piece. I'm going to go through that too. Uh, but the, I literally just got it working <laughs> one minute before the call started. So uh, there's more work to be done. But we should see the, and I could draw a sort of a line at the mean, but we should see the colluder distribution move to the left as we increase the number of the simulation. Um, so let's keep going. So that's this little like toy simulator that we can expand and um, kind of and we can learn a lot from the simulator that we already have and that's another thing about this reusable modular components is we can pull in the code we can actually import the optimality gap functions and and you and start to expand uh, this simulator here. Um, so now I just brought up the what I had linked to here, this using custom environments. So I, I grabbed this and I started making a very simple custom environment and this needs to be expanded yet but it's just sort of a working toy example of how we can have um, oh these comments are from a different okay so our action space is to collude or not to collude. And uh, observation space is, I, I wasn't really sure exactly what this observation, observation space should be. So I'm actually not even using it yet. Uh, so I just return one. Oh yeah, I just return one as the observation. Um, mainly this is just like skeleton code that people can use as a template. And then in our action space, we have uh, either collude or don't collude. And um, then we have the resetting the simulation. These are just standard. This is the standard interface to a, a gym environment. Um, we get our reward from taking our action, which returns the results of either colluding or not colluding. And so remember, uh, colluding returns a probability distribution of optimality. So this is saying, Basically, an agent is a grant, and if it doesn't collude, it's going to have some random, it's going to be a random sample of our probability distribution with a mean of 0 0.5 optimality. And if, if that grant did collude, then it's going to be a random sample of a probability distribution with mean 0 0.3. Um, 
So we get the reward. Um, we take our observation. We track our uh, samples. So we our reward is the optimality. And I, I guess actually in this case, reward is like like the lower, we want to minimize our reward because the reward is the optimality gap. So I run, I define this environment and then I plug in a multi-layer perceptron policy, which is just a deep neural network and use this proximal policy optimizer, which is one of the most stable uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. And you can learn about that here in the documentation. And then we have it learn for 2,000 time steps. And this just takes some time. Um, and then we have it uh, run for another 2,000 time steps. And then we get the performance. And we get this distribution here, which is the, um, it's, it's the, I think what we have here is the distribution of optimality gaps over all the colluder, wait, action, what is the action? Self.take, um, oh, yeah, so it's going to be sampling. Actually, th it, these are going to be colluding and not colluding um, because we have this action space um, of collude and don't collude. Yeah, I actually just wrote this this morning, so it needs to be fleshed out. But the goal here was to get sort of a working template that people can use and copy and fill in more deeper modeling um, concepts. And I think it fits well with what Danilo has uh, with all of the optimal optimality gap functionality. I think it can kind of be mixed and matched and expanded. But um, yeah, this is where I got to today. Basically, a working skeleton framework for how to run this kind of simulator with colluders and non-colluders, and then uh, just a skeleton example of how we can take those collude and not collude functions and wire them into a reinforcement learning environment. Now, what we're, we're, we're going to want to do is take this environment, I believe, and actually put it inside of our simulator, um, I think inside of our policy functions. But this is going to require some collaborative work. And um, yeah, so I set up, so the, the token engineering labs are every Friday. So this Friday was had, had nothing booked. So I thought, what a good time. We can just set up sort of an office hours or a drop in um, if anyone wants to collaborate on this or go over any, th any research topics. It's going to be more of kind of an open space um, for people to drop in and maybe do some of the more hacky stuff <laughs> that I had going in my terminal here um, with like running the tests and expanding on that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, that's, and this, this notebook is pushed to um, my fork on the long tail financial repo. And I can probably, I think what I'll do is I'll just push I'll push this uh, notebook upstream to the Gitcoin repository, um, I think. Or maybe it should be fleshed out a bit more. But So that's, that's really uh, all I got. <laughs> Cool. Thanks for sharing, Sean. Are there any questions or comments? I mean, this this route, I have some questions, but I want you to go first, all the others in the call. Um, but this route reinforcement learning might probably be, say, let's say, a second branch. So one branch, the, the math working group, one branch, reinforcement learning. Um, and I think it might be valuable to team up here and um, yeah, collaborate on how how to make the most of it. But yeah, any questions or comments on that? Yeah, Basically, so... like I don't have any questions, but I definitely like props for for this work. Like it's it's very impressive, Sean. Thank you. 
Yeah, Sean. Hi, Mark here. Hey, Mark. I, uh, of course, have a sweet spot for uh, reinforcement learning agents, <laughs> um, as you might imagine. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, two questions. What, what, kind of, what version of stable baselines did you use for this? Yeah, really good question. Um, this is always tripping me up, but finally, I go that's why I, I really wanted to get to this point of having this stable framework uh, skeleton, because I'm using stable baselines three. Yeah, okay. Is that what you're yeah. using in the um, energy web? No, because I didn't get it working, but... Um... <laughs> okay. So this is, this is uh, one step further ahead, uh, so that's nice. Okay, um, and what about the second question? Um, how would we model the observation space? Would we, uh, let's say, um, import some, some of the um, quadratic, quadratic funding um, algorithms into the observation space or something like oh, that? Oh, yeah. Because... Well, I think it would be, uh, it just clicked. I think it's quite simple. I think the observation space is all the grants available. And then the action space is basically a subset of the grants, which the con the contributor is going to fund. Okay, and, and how does the agent learn uh, of that? Oh yeah, yeah. So we need we need more data. So it's not just the nodes; it's the actual um, edge. So it's the whole graph. Basically, the graph is the observation space. So this might blow up computationally, um, but Maybe not. And then also, I think there's just, we might want to label the nodes with like, a given given a colluder is observing the graph, it's pro it's just going to want to know which, which grants are mine. Basically, which grants do we want to collude on? Which grants are mine and my, and my colluders? Um, and who are my colluders? Um, so yeah, really the observation space could be like the entire graph. I mean, it, yeah, it could be the entire network, right? With all, the, all of its respective metadata. But now we're talking about how, okay, how do we encode that as an observation space? Um, well, now we're back to the vectorization <laughs> because we could probably do an adjacency matrix for the network and I think that could be a pretty good observation space, actually. Then we could even have the meta metadata involved. So we could have a three-dimensional tensor where we have rows are contributors and columns are grants. And then at a row and a column, like, first of all, you could have a one if that contributor has contributed to that grant or zero otherwise. Or you could have this sort of a vector Mm. Yeah, I, I I can imagine also the weights are of importance there. The weights of the the amounts being staked on on, on mm -hmm. grant. But yeah. uh, it's getting real complicated then with three dimensional tensors. <laughs> it's not so bad. <laughs> this is not my cup of tea. <laughs> okay, thanks. But that's a really yeah, that's a good point, Mark. Uh... The observa I, I had that hadn't clicked. I was like, what is the observation space going to be? But oh yeah, it, I think it's basically the you start with the graph, the the the, the graph that we have, and um, then fa there might be issues to face like complexity or encoding. But I think we could do it. Anyone else? I'm not sure if I can understand Danilo. It's hard to understand you. Can you do something about your mic? Okay, Danilo, can you let me know if you wanted to talk? There were some noises, but I wasn't been able to understand anything. Um, uh, but... 
Yeah, I heard someone saying something about graphs, uh, but it was very quiet. Yeah, me too. Me too. Mm -hmm. I thought it was Danilo. Uh, is it better now? The voice? Yes, oh, it's yeah. better. Much better. Yeah, I was in <laughs> some simulations of the. Uh, so yeah, I think this is great work, and I mean, I think this is a this is a good scaffold for the start experiment. And I think this is part is important because, let's say, we don't know exactly yet what is the kinds of attack vectors that we do have. Uh, we know that there are two kinds of attack vectors, but mapping out the combinations that could exist, uh, I think that they could have several applications. First one is because. Just by getting to know what is the, let's say, strategies that can be attack vectors, it is interesting by itself. But the second one is that this could be used as a risk is also for, let's say, improving the optimality gap calculations. Because, I mean, if you change the starting point, then instead of having to wait uh, lots of time steps to, to, uh, for the optimality gap calculation to converge, you could then, let's say, use a trick and change the starting point so that it converges quickly. Yeah, that, sounds good. That's what um, when Zargum was here the other day, we were talking about sort of seeding the optimality uh, search functions with um, heuristics, right? Like sort of local areas that are probably optimal, like. Um, sort of maybe what we were talking about earlier with like fully connected subgraphs. Uh, the fully connected subgraphs would be vectors, but there is another one which is, let's say sort of party, uh, partially connected ones, just like uh, Octopus has showed uh, earlier today. Mm. Mm -hmm. But uh, those are two cases, but there is the probability that there are more other, there are other local bottom beyond the, the, those. Okay, I again don't have any sound. Okay, Sean, Danilo, are you still there? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you you have been finished, obviously, Danilo. <laughs> Sorry, today this is really tricky. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I guess this is definitely um, a go. So this direction could be really interesting and maybe we can also form a group um if there are no other questions at the moment regarding sean's approach i have another one so to what extent would you say okay is it worth finding based on heuristics defining agents behavior to not start from zero and then model agents um, is is it would it be worth having a brainstorming on that? Yeah. So, do you mean kind of almost like personifying these agents? Like, what would exactly? Yeah. Like, yeah. what would a colluder? You know, what, where might they be starting, or what might there be mm. be their motivation, or how many mm. might there be, and all these different things to set up these kind of like personified agent scenarios. That's cool. Yeah, I was. Yeah. That's. A, I mean, we don't have to do it now, but perhaps uh, in in a working session. I was just from my observations in our own grant. There are some things that that I I from a qualitative point of view that I feel there are some patterns here, also due to the collections and due to community work. Um, yeah, and then I was just thinking, okay, how can we funnel this or plug this knowledge into modeling the agents, just in case you're interested. In... Yeah, Maybe there, I, there could yeah. be some more insights on that. I think yeah. that might even be like necessary for success because maybe the search space of 
of the whole grant and all the possible ways to act is too big and we might not mm. get results. But if we do look at these specific cases, then mm. we might be able to get specific insights on those cases using these techniques. Yeah. Okay, on a side note. Mm -hmm. Now, before we close the call, I'd like to um, have some first voices, thoughts on how should we structure our work. So I feel that we could have at least two working groups. One is the math one, one is the reinforcement learning. And there should be, I would suggest that we have on Tuesdays a session with sharing. So either educational presentations as we had it today or um, sharing results. So we, I would love to keep at least one hour for this purpose. And then from there, of course, we can say, let's have Tuesdays um, for then split off in working groups to have a weekly slot or not sure. Of course, this is also on, on um, every single working group uh, to decide and to define, and you can also work asynchronously. I'd like to have your opinion. What works better for you guys? Fixed slots or asynchronous working in working groups? For me, I like the idea of fixed slots because I find it a little bit difficult to keep up with async. I know, I think maybe for most people, async groups work good or work better. But for me, sometimes uh, I find the time slips away. And then it's I find the having the dedicated sessions uh, m make more of a commitment for everyone to be prepared and come together beforehand. Mm -hmm. And but that's just that's just my mm -hmm. one thought. Any other voices here? For the fix work, uh, the, the fix work and and the other option, like I don't really have a preference, but I definitely uh, think that uh, to to group people into working groups that that's definitely valuable. Like I also started researching another area um, uh -huh. that might be interesting, but I still I'm not sure whether it is a dead end. So like I would rather first see whether there's something there. Uh -huh. And then, um, yeah, so maybe just a question to the whole group, whether somebody already uh, looked into Note to VEC as basically the, the presentation learning to, to, to kind of classify um, uh, inclusion uh, in, in the Gitcoin grants, yeah. If somebody like thought about it, looked into it, anyway. I I have I don't um, I don't know anything about it, but it sounds really interesting. Node to vec, um, it sounds it sounds like yeah, so, word to vec, but for graphs. Uh, yeah, so so it's similar. Like I think it's like a paper from two thousand sixteen, and it's also you have an implementation in Python, so it's super interesting. And also I remember like I, I like my my math background is not as strong, but I remember that you, that that the the the. Yeah, like the discussion was also into vectorizing certain operations. And I think that it might be that there are some math patterns in the paper itself for the implementation that yeah, like the, the the more math focused people in the group could, could capitalize on. So I think word to vec is, is the algorithm that Google used or what, kind of what made them so efficient. That's more of an NLP technique, isn't it? So one is word to vec, which is basically like representing uh, words in in different dimensions, right? Let's say like uh, whatever, like a cloud, and then you put like uh, like a vector of of two hundred uh, scalars, right, or numbers. But this is a node to vec, so basically representation learning of networks. The difference here. Oh, okay, sorry, I misheard you. I would be interested in, in joining that working group if there's a working group around node to vec because 
Uh, Jan, um, I, all, uh, I also uh, liked your presentation about the data, uh, well, the data science stuff or the data exploration stuff. Uh, on a side note, I was wondering if um, Danilo has any chance of um, getting the data, the anonymous data of Awoki, of the Gitcoin grants uh, rounds. Any news on that? Mm, uh, I'm looking at that. Uh, I'll try to have that data by the end of this week, but uh, I'll, I'll send a message to Awoki today. Okay, thanks. But yeah, Jan, I'm happy to, to work with you on the data and now to VEC stuff. Perfect. Yeah, I will, I will probably just like do some initial work. And yeah, like I, I basically just like did some, some, yeah, some research, but to like, I would like to start playing with the data and, and see whether it's worth exploring like that. We don't bump into some dead end, like uh, uh, from the beginning already. That's, that's the only um, thing that I have. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, more, maybe, more Jan, it, <laughs> maybe, Jan, it's worth, I mean, you are exploring at the moment, but uh, uh, maybe it's also worth sharing what you found next week, because then if anybody else will get a better picture of what's the potential here and why it could be so exciting and also how to um, apply skills and work in that directions. Uh, that just that sounds good. Yeah. So like one option is also yeah that I basically present not to vac applied to to um to get grants like next week. That that would be one option that would yeah um, make this more tangible. Exactly. That's that's um my my thoughts. And of course, in addition to feel free to start a working group. Uh, with Mark and potentially others to work on that, uh, on that, let's say, approach and then see uh, what could be the result and the value for Gitcoin grants, of course. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. So I think I will, um, I will create a new page in our uh, new sheet in our one-stop shop and just take down um, the free working groups we have now, um, assign some time slots, and then feel free to add yourself to the, uh, to the groups and start working. Um, and we will meet again this week on Thursday for Danilo's hacking session, and then every Tuesday for presentations and um, splitting off in working groups and make progress there. All right? Awesome. Okay. Dan great. Danilo, any news, final notes on the agenda for Thursday? I'm still thinking on it, but uh, I'm considering maybe maybe implementing a iterative version of the, uh, of the quadratic funding algorithm mm -hmm. so that we can get some performance speed ups. Okay. But, but I still need to think about that. But this is my bias for now. All right. Sounds good. Anyways, so thank you all oh, for joining. Everyone, I'm, Any, so yeah. this Friday in the TEC lab, it's just going to be an open space for oh. anyone to come and share ideas and sort of if you have any questions about maybe running the simulators or changing them um, or anything with the Jupyter notebook experiments, um, it'll be kind of a hands-on open session, like a like an office hours kind of. Cool. I'll add that to our calendar too. Thanks for the reminder. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for today. Um, see you on Thursday and uh, looking forward to all the new research that is coming up. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.